Okay, so let's derive the group and phase velocity. So we're going to consider a pulse of some shape f of x and the Fourier transform, capital F of k, and it's traveling through a medium with dispersion so that omega is some function of k that we write omega of k like this. And we're going to assume the pulse has a narrow range of frequencies. So in the previous example, we looked at the, the modulated Gaussian. This would correspond to a Gaussian that is quite wide in real space, giving us a narrow band of frequencies in, in k space. So in this narrow range of k and omega, we'll assume that omega is linear in k. So what I mean by that is we look at the dispersion relation. So we have some relationship between omega and k, which is this dispersion relation. I'm drawing this black curve here. We're going to consider just a narrow range of k values, giving us just a narrow range of omega values, and we're going to just approximate this as linear by taking a tangent to this curve here. So what we're doing is expanding the dispersion relation to first order around the center frequencies, omega c and kc of the pulse. So the center frequency, center temporal frequency, and center uh, spatial frequency. So in other words, we're saying omega of k is approximately equal to omega c plus the derivative of kc times k minus kc. So it's a first order Taylor expansion. And we're going to write it like this, where we're saying that the omega dk at kc is equal to vg. And vg will be the group velocity, sort of anticipating what we're about to find out. Now if we write down the pulse propagation as a Fourier integral using recipe 1, we get the following, that f of x and t is equal to this integral here, so this is the inverse Fourier transform, where we're integrating over the function capital F of k, so this is the Fourier components in our wave, and we're rotating each Fourier component in complex space using this complex exponential here, and the speed of the rotation depends on omega, omega depends on k, so we take this dispersion relation here, we expand to first order, and we get this approximation here. Now we're going to take out all the terms to the out the front of the integral that do not depend on the variable of integration k to give us this expression here. So these terms don't depend on k, and these terms do. We can simplify it a little by uh, rewriting this exponential out the front as a single exponential like this, taking out a factor of kc, and then we get a group velocity minus omega c divided by kc, and this integral here. Okay. Now we have the rather difficult job of interpreting this integral. Let's first consider the situation where omega is equal to ck. So we're turning the dispersion off. We're saying that this dispersion curve is no longer a curve, it's just a straight, a straight line. That's what we have when you have no dispersion. In that case, vg, the group velocity, is equal to c, the slope of the line, and omega divided by k is also equal to c. So this phase factor out the front here goes away because vg minus omega c divided by kc is zero. If we look at this integral now, then what we have is just the uh, Fourier transform of the wave, capital F of k, multiplied by an exponential that has e to the i k x minus ct. So the group velocity of vg here would be equal to c. This is exactly the same integral we found for the case with no dispersion. So what that integral would then do is move our wave, so whatever original shape we had, which might be the modulated Gaussian, it would move it at the speed c. And there'd be no difference in the speed of the envelope or the ripples because that whole waveform is just moving with all the frequencies being rotated uh, at the speed that gives you just dispersion-free propagation. Now if we turn the dispersion back on so that this is no longer true, we still have this integral here, which is moving our wave at a speed now vg, which is not equal to c. And so this integral here is still moving that wave. It's still moving that wave altogether at a speed vg. So that's what this integral will do. It moves the whole envelope, including the ripples, at some speed vg. The phase term out the front here is a bit that gives you the difference in the speed speed of the envelope and the speed of the ripples underneath, because this term out the front here contains a phase factor which is the difference between vg and omega c divided by kc. So vg is the group velocity that moves the envelope. This term out the front here, the speed of the ripples in fact is given by omega c divided by kc, so it's the ratio of omega and c, and so it's the difference here between vg and the phase velocity, v phase, that will determine the difference in speed between the ripples and the, the velocity of the wave. 
Now that all sounds a little bit complicated and it is actually pretty complicated. So, uh, you know, interpreting these integrals is, is not an easy task, but the, the main message you want to get over, get over here is that VG here is the thing that moves the whole wave. This term out the front here is the thing that gives you the difference between the, the velocity of the envelope and the velocity of the ripples underneath. And when these two terms are the same, then everything, uh, everything goes away and we just get back to dispersion free propagation. But looking at this equation here, you, you may be alarmed if you're looking really closely because this term out the front here is a complex exponential. And so this function here, f of x and t, is not a real function. It's some complex function. And this should be kind of alarming because we started off with some function f of x, which is real, and we're propagating it in time, and we expect to have a real function. I mean, what does it even mean if this is a complex function? It actually means we've done something a little wrong, or at least something a little cavalier in this derivation. And so the thing that we've done is we've expanded our dispersion relation around some value kc, but in fact, there are two values kc we need to expand our dispersion relation around. If we go back and look at this example of a narrowband uh, wave where we have some small range of frequencies in k-space, we have a range of frequencies at plus k and a range of frequencies at minus k. So that means when we do this expansion, really we need to expand twice. We should expand once in positive k and also once in negative k. That means this equation here wouldn't just be one equation, we'd have one equation for the dispersion relation at positive k's and another equation for the dispersion relation around negative k's. And then to get this uh, function f of x and t, we'd have to add up two different integrals, one for the positive k's and one for the negative k's. What that would give us then would be this plus its complex conjugate. Now this dovetails nicely and sort of uh, is an example of a property of Fourier transforms. And this property is that if f of x is a real function, then the Fourier transform has a real part that is even and an imaginary part that is odd. Or, in other words, the positive part of the Fourier transform, so the capital F at positive k, is equal to the complex conjugate of the transform over negative k. So what that means is you can do cavalier derivations like this, where you just go through and treat all of the positive k's, for example. You get to some result here that is clearly not real, and to fix it, you just add the complex conjugate. And that gives you the other part of the Fourier transform that you're missing, so that when you take the sum of these two things, you end up with the correct answer, which is a real function.